Welcome to Embedded. I am Elysia White here with Christopher White. And I think I could use some silly. I could use some play. I could be a five-year-old with Play-Doh. Mix all that with electricity. Let's have Professor Anne-Marie Thomas talk to us about squishy circuits and learning and innovation and entrepreneurship. Hello, Professor Thomas. Welcome to the show. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Could you tell us about yourself as if we met at Hackaday's Supercon? Uh, I love the context there because I wear a couple of different hats. I am an engineering and business and professor who also teaches education uh, in Minnesota. Um, and I run a lab on playful learning where we look at the intersection of art, technology, and K-12 education, which is a fancy way of saying we love smashing unusual combinations of things together and seeing how we can use them to learn. All right. And I believe that's that does include Play-Doh. It definitely includes Play-Doh. We'd like to get started with lightning round where we ask you short questions and we want short answers. And if we're behaving ourselves, we won't ask for much deeper questions until the end. Perfect. Favorite Ambari project? Favorite Ambari, as in M-B-A-R-I Ambari? Monterey Bay Aquarium Monterey Research Bay Aquarium? Institute. Ah. I love their underwater robots. Uh, so they're AUV, they're autonomous underwater uh, vehicles. You weren't expecting that one, were you? I wasn't. I like that one. Oh, no, actually, the proper answer is whichever project any of my research students are working on as an intern this summer there. Do you have any research project interns at Ambari this year? I did. I have. We are starting the semester here in Minnesota, but I had one student, uh, Joel Rodick, who is a senior engineering student who was working there on camera systems this past summer. And last year, two years ago, we had an education major there. Um, so at the Playful Learning Lab, we're big fans of Imbari. I was an intern there 20, more than 20 years ago myself. So it's, I feel old, but it's fun watching my students do things that were life-changing for me decades ago. I work on some of the projects, so I'm quite familiar with them and think they're a great institute. Yes, one of my favorites. Salty or sweet? Ooh, sweet. STEAM, the acronym. Which is your favorite letter? <laughs> Ooh, none of them. I'm a fan of the, the holistic education approach. Can't have a favorite. Rank these three schools in order of worst to best. <laughs> what? Caltech, MIT, and Harvey Mudd College. I would like my friends to still speak to me. So I I will have to plead the fifth on that one. What's nice. She didn't just say Harvey Mudd to start with is the worst because that's the only one she hasn't gone to. That's a great school. That's the only school I know that has a professional magician teaching in their math department. So I I couldn't rank them down. But as an alum of MIT, I can't rank them down either. I've taken classes from him. Uh, Oh, right. Mine. Um, you walk into a sixth grade classroom and have to teach them something for an hour. What do you go with? Something for an hour. I think we would do storytelling if I just walked in. We'd write a story together. Complete one project or start a dozen? <laughs> oh, aspirational. Um, I'd have to say if, if you're asking, <laughs> hmm. I typically start a dozen, but I think if, if I, I, would, I would aspire to complete one. Favorite fictional robot? BB-8. Do you have a tip everyone should know? Oh, I sound like a kindergarten teacher, which is also aspirational for me, but be kind to everybody because you never know what other people are secretly dealing with. With that set up, I thought you were going to say, take more naps. I did too. Oh, definitely take more naps too, but that goes without saying. (laughs) So you said in your introduction, you're a professor of engineering and of business and education and playful learning? And how do all these things mix? You know, I'm now in my mid forties and I have spent the last couple decades trying to figure out how to make a nice linear path out of my life story. And I think I can only do that retroactively. So to be honest, it's, I follow what is interesting at the time and often they lead to learning new things and going into new fields. And when you enter a new space, you often see how it relates to the places you've already been. Um, so as an academic, I've been incredibly fortunate to be able to combine those. Um, I, If you had asked little me what I was going to major in, I wanted to be an artist or an actress or a painter. Um, ended up going to college for engineering, but got into music composition while I was there and then wanted to teach. So I had to get a PhD because I'm old enough that we didn't used to have high school, you know, in elementary school, middle school engineering. 
Um, and all of these things have kind of led to the other, meeting someone and deciding to learn a new thing and having the great privilege of being in a field as an academic where I can pull in seemingly unrelated disciplines. Um, but I think the first two, engineering and business, make a ton of sense together, as many of your guests have talked about and who have started businesses and hardware and software companies. Um, understanding both of those um, really benefits you um, as an inventor, as a, as I would argue, as anyone. You did a TED Talk about squishy circuits, about using Play-Doh to transport electricity to light lights and was this, where did that fit in with your art, business, engineering pyramid? If it's very much into my being a parent, um, I have two daughters and Squishy Circuits really came out of wanting to do something for them. Um, I think my oldest daughter was a toddler at the time and it was as the maker movement was taking off and I had done a PhD in a robotics lab and I was really admiring a lot of the things I was seeing in the maker movement, the sewable circuits and the paintable circuits in the early days of like bare conductive. But none of them really lent themselves to use by little kids with kind of toddler toddler fingers um, or to classroom uses where if you, you know, limited budget, you can only buy so many supplies. And so if you painted a circuit, like you'd have to buy more electronic, more conductive paint or more electric tape and really wanting a way that you could build something and then literally squish it up and do it again um, and never assuming that it would go anywhere beyond my kids in the kitchen and maybe my lab and some of the schools we work with. Um, but we we were able to develop a conductive Play-Doh recipe and a non-conductive Play-Doh recipe. And my kids liked it. And then the schools liked it. Um, and we were we were sort of surprised to find that it was fairly novel and took off way beyond what I thought a project in my kitchen would turn into, um, much to the credit of my students who have gone on and started it as a company. It's kind of funny because there have always been a few homemade Play-Doh recipes. And I shouldn't say Play-Doh because that's probably trademarked, but that's how we all know it. So go in with it. But I mean, flour and water and cornstarch and salts was one of the recipes and the other was sugar instead of salt. Yeah. yeah the, the main difference was sugar instead of salt um, for, for the one that is technically not insulating, but much, much, much less conductive. Um, the other big difference is actually the type of water you use. Uh, our tap water has so much stuff in it that it conducts electricity. Um, so we, for our quasi-insulating or less conductive dough, we use um, we use uh, distilled or deionized water. Uh, and, you know, when we were doing this, people, it, it seems so obvious now, and I had some engineers say, oh, well, you're not going to be able to make, you know, circuits that light up with Play-Doh as the wires. And it actually was apparently novel in education to look at it this way, but the field of circuit benders, there were there were circuit benders making music using Play-Doh to short out kids' toys um, before squishy circuits came along. So that was fascinating. One of those things where the academic world doesn't always look at the same, the same, well, typically will look at the same research, but not notice things happening in maybe the maker art world. So was this innovative in whatever that word is supposed to mean? Oh, it's a hard question to ask me um, because I tend to do projects when I feel like there's something that needs to get done and it could help the people around me. Um, and I typically will then let others decide um, whether it's useful to them. Um, Squishy Circuits was personal. It was for my kids. And then it was for my my the schools that I helped out with, the public schools here in the Twin Cities. Um, and it really was only because people started asking us for the recipes that we started sharing them. And it was always on our website, all the recipes which battery packs to buy. It wasn't supposed to be a company. Um, we didn't even publish curriculum be for the first year because I said that I wanted people to use it however they wanted to. And so we shared other people's curriculum and showing what people around the world were doing with it. The Squishy Circuit store actually started because one of my students had, who was working on the project as a research student, their, one of their parents is a teacher. And they said they'd love to use it, but they didn't want to solder the battery packs together and put mm. the right little um, bits on them. Um, and as a mother of two, a pre-tenure professor, it wasn't in my uh, to-do list to start a company. Uh, so this young gentleman, Matthew Schmidtbauer, started it. And um, wow, it's a decade later and that, that company still exists. Um, so I wasn't asking if it was innovative or, or if it was going to change the world. I was saying, you know, can I do this? And would this help the kids and the teachers that I know? Um, you know, a cheap way of making the circuitry that they can reuse. Uh, and so it's been delightful seeing how it has taken off. Um, but I, that wasn't that wasn't the mindset I set out 
to explore in. It ended up being a pretty high for profile project. Very much. So. Are there other projects that have had similar starts that you wish had gotten more attention? Oh, that's a really good question. You should thank Lenore for that one because she totally fed me that. You know, it's interesting because one of the things my work has always been, both as a professor and as a consultant, as an artist, I, I focus on the collaborations. Who do I want to work with and where can I do something that is meaningful to other people? And so each of our projects at the Playful Learning Lab, um, which you know really constitutes about 25 undergraduate research students and a couple of other professors who play with us, we set out to do the work because we think it's important, um, not because it'll get attention. And some of them get attention, but we often, we don't really care about the big press. We care about attention in the communities we work in. Uh, so for example, we, years ago, a student who had actually applied to work on the Squishy Circuits project, it wasn't the right fit for a project for her. But the question I asked her um, at the end of the interview was, well, if I didn't hire you for this project, is there something else you'd like to work on? And she paused, uh, her name is Bryn Casper, and she paused and thought about it and said, well, part of my family is deaf and deaf and hard of hearing kids don't have the same opportunities um, that, that hearing kids do in STEM. Um, so I guess I'd want to work on that. And we started a project then that we did after school, um, science and STEM and STEAM classes and workshops at Metro Deaf School, which is an incredible birth through 21 uh, charter school for deaf and hard of hearing children in the Twin Cities. And that you know started as a small thing. It led to a summer camp during 2020 where kids got boxes and did materials, even though the, the pandemic had them in their homes. It led to a uh, episode of the TV show on PBS, Sci Girls. And so while many people won't know that project per se, um, I think it got attention from the right people. We were able to get the resources to the schools that needed it. Um, you know, that's one of the joys of this work is we can find an immediate need and go do something, even if we're not going to get tons of attention for it. Um, so to directly answer your question of are there projects I wish had gotten attention? I don't think so, because I've never set out with a project hoping to get attention. Um, we always hope to do the work. And if the people we're doing the work for like it, that we've been successful. Um, and often attention just means that you get to bring that work to more people, which is a privilege. And did that uh, work turn into playgroundcamp.org or is that something separate? Oh, yes. Yeah. So the summer of 2020, um, we had, we, well, going back a little further, as we all know, the world changed a lot in 2020, <laughs> um, particularly in the spring and summer of it. Um, and in our lab, we were very focused on a few projects, but then everything changed. Um, and I was actually in Denmark um, or in early March of 2020 um, and had won an award. Um, our lab had won the Lego Prize, which comes with research funding. Um, and as I'm rushing home, the conference that would have been conferred at didn't happen. And I'm rushing home. I was getting emails from a lot of my, my research students who, again, are all undergrads. And so much uncertainty. And over the coming weeks... Some students lost family members, but other almost actually every student lost any summer internship they lined up. Companies had dropped oh, internships. Yeah. And so we decided well, we have this funding. And I sent out an email and offered to all of my research students that they could be funded for the whole summer. They all got raises. I said, we'll probably run out of money in September, but we have three months. What is the most good that we can do to help during this difficult time? We're also in the Twin Cities. So the spring of 2020 was not just the pandemic. It was also the killing of George Floyd, um, the mm. gas station on the corner corner of my street here, burnt down. Um, you know, this was this was a really tough time for our community. And so these amazing 18 to 22 year olds looked at it and said, well, a lot of our community, they could use playful things. So we've got to do something there. But the kids at Metro Deaf School have all been sent home and some of them are deaf blind. And all of them, some of them have family members who don't sign and school was the place they communicated. How could we create something to help them? And so using the, the Lego Prize funding, we created hundreds of videos um, that were all different STEM activities. Um, and we recorded all the videos in American Sign Language, in English, in Spanish, and in Arabic, um, because many of the homes of the kids we were working with, the parents didn't speak English or didn't sign. Um, and we were doing this in the early days of the pandemic. So with long telephoto lenses and no one getting near each other and filming outside. But for the summer of 2020, every week, about 85 children would get a box on their door 
and it had it had science supplies in it. Maybe it had Lego. Maybe it had motors. Maybe it had squishy circuits. It always had some snacks. Um, we'd leave them outside because remember we didn't know how long you had to let something sit before you touched it if someone else had. Um, so yeah, that that project that project um, came out of the work of this student who applied for squishy circuits about eight years earlier and didn't get the job and yet found this need. And you know, at the time, I knew nothing about the deaf community. Um, a decade later, I'm a student um, in the extension program at Gallaudet University. Um, I've taken about seven classes on American Sign Language and deaf culture. I'm not an expert by any means, um, but I have incredible colleagues in the deaf community that I can work with. Um, and actually this past summer, so summer of 2023, um, we have been working on coding in the deaf community and we ran a course for teachers of deaf and hard of hearing kids um, who were learning how to program in the scratch programming language. And they got some squishy circuits and Mickey makeys and other things. Um, but we also were able to have an incredible deaf woman create interpretations for some coding videos that had come out of Harvard that were currently in English. Um, so I never know where these projects are going to go. Squishy circuits somehow leads to computer science in American Sign Language. Um, I could never predict that. Some of the videos on the playgroundcamp.org, uh, I mean, there are, as you said, hundreds of videos and little uh, lesson plans and written lectures and what you need. And not everything needs a box. I mean, a, a lot of it is stuff you can get at home or, or, or make. Um, like like the Play-Doh, but how much of it was about the fun, the playfulness, the doing something, and how much was it about curriculum? Oh, we did that summer. We didn't really care at all about curriculum. Um, you know, and you were in a city during a pandemic, kids are at home, we're having all the challenges the Twin Cities were having. Our main goal was connecting kids to each other. So there would be Zoom calls where they were signing with each other, um, and, you know, this is also happening the same time we launched the playground. We also had something called the play line in March of 2020. Um, as I mentioned, I was flying back from Denmark, um, rushing home before I wouldn't be allowed to fly back anymore. And mm -hmm. on the plane, um, I was emailing the only other person who had come from the U.S. to Denmark for that event, Carly Shiraki, who was a kids TV host. And the two of us were commenting on how this was going to change education around the world no one really knew what was coming in terms of the pandemic and how do you switch online and that teachers were going to have to help each other and how could we connect them. And so from March of 2020, for over a year, we held daily, and actually it was twice daily for the first three months, um, open Zoom calls where teachers anywhere in the world could jump into the play line and just chat for half an hour. And it truly was, we do, did them twice a day because we had people around the world. And it was a chance for teachers to just laugh or share what was going on or cry or vent. Um, and what was really fascinating for us was because it was started, we started immediately mid-March 2020, things were worse in certain countries, kind of the waves were traveling. So we could hear from the Italian teachers or some of the US teachers could comment on the problems they were going to have with all the kids who didn't have Wi-Fi. And it turns out that was going to be an issue in Australia. Um, and, you know, in that case, just like Playground, one of our main goals was connection. Um, I think one of the most important things is that we connect to other people, we share ideas, uh, the curriculum follows. And that's very different than if we're, we're creating, you know, a in-school program and maybe in math class, we're going to start with a curriculum. But I think it's very important for us always to look at what are the goals of what we're doing? Sort of to your earlier question of which projects don't get attention. Well, if the goal is attention, then that's problematic. But in some cases, it's just doing the work. And so if the goal is to have kids be engaged and enjoy their time. Well, maybe that's what we focus on. And we look at the playfulness less so than the exact standards that we're covering. On the other hand, if we're teaching a class that, that is crucial to another course in a student's academic um, trajectory, well, then we're definitely going to look at the standards. But even if we said that the curriculum is driving it, I, I would posit, um, and I suspect many of my research students would as well, that we can put a playful lens on learning almost anything. Um, you know, we, we took a class at the university, gosh, over a decade ago where we were teaching Lagrangian uh, dynamics um, and force and motion. Well, you can do that in a basement. If you're teaching someone about springs and pendulums, you can swing a pendulum uh, on a string uh, or you can take a little spring or you could partner with a local, cir local circus school and have your engineering <laughs> students put on you know, harnesses. And instead of, instead of swinging a little tiny pendulum, you swing your engineering students 40 feet up on a flying trapeze. Instead of a little tiny spring, you have them jump off of a bungee trapeze and you take measurements and you look at, you look at their oscillations. Um, and you can take something that's 
pretty serious lab process and mathematics and look at it in a new light that hopefully is a little more joyful. Uh, so, so I would argue that play and curriculum don't have to be separated, um, but which one, which one you consider first maybe depends on the setting. What sort of projects are you working on now? Oh, so I'm very lucky. I am a professor, um, which means that I'm on sabbatical. Well, I can have sabbaticals once every seven or eight years. Um, so I'm on a sabbatical. This is actually going to be the first year First time in 19 years, I've gone more than 12 months without teaching. Um, never done that. I don't think I've ever gone more than nine months without teaching in the last 19 years. So I'm not teaching this coming year, um, but I am working on a couple projects. Um, one, we're finishing up writing up a bunch of papers with my awesome undergrads that just submitted one to a journal that was accepted yesterday, um, looking at the coding and electronics work that they did all of last year at Metro Depth School. Um, we taught a middle school electronics class that was 20 days long and taught, taught, taken by every middle schooler at, at Metro Deaf School in the Twin Cities. Um, so writing up those papers. We're also um, working with the Minnesota Children's Museum. We've worked with them for the last five years on designing exhibits um, and hands-on activities and also uh, engagement for adults at children's museums. But this specific one, they in summer of 2024, they are going to have an exhibit called uh, Monster, Monsters on Summer Vacation. And so I'm, I'm actually doing some exhibit design, which I haven't done hands-on by myself in a long time. Uh, so I get to spend some time in the shop and ordering equipment and have an exhibit that hopefully will be unveiled in a few months there. Um, and my, my kind of secret project, I always feel sabbaticals, you should do some projects that'll get the papers, but you should also take some risks. Um, and so my, my personal sabbatical project, which I hope goes somewhere, um, has actually been looking at the history and practice of magic. Um, so actually like magicians, magic wand, uh, sleight of hand, um, for the last couple of years, um, ever since the pandemic, I've, I've had a magic tutor. Um, and one of my, one of my daughters is quite skilled at sleight of hand. So I'm diving into that. Um, and I should say that that actually started because for a while I had a young man who was an electrical engineering major, but also a professional magician, uh, working in my research lab. Uh, so when the pandemic hit, I was like, oh, I should, I should learn those cool things that Patrick does. Um, I'm really fascinated by magic as a teacher because it's all about what you believe and what you notice. And I feel like there's some really interesting corollaries between sleight of hand and misdirection that apply and can be used in a classroom. But also, maybe a little further, in these days of AI and fake news and deep fakes, how do we believe what we believe? Um, and so that's that's the question that I think people have been wrestling with for a long time in magic, but maybe not from that direction. So I've been deep diving in, in the history of magic and the psychology of magic. There's some phenomenal books that have come out recently by some psychologists on magic. And then, frankly, it's just fun to look at the engineering behind um, a lot of the different illusions that are in that repertoire. Um, and then a project that um, makes six-year-old me inside somewhere deep down, super happy is I'm um, spending some time working with one of my favorite companies. Um, I'm doing a consulting collaboration project uh, with Lego in Denmark. Um, so my kids are happy because it means I come home with black licorice and Lego <laughs> for them. Um, but they have an amazing Lego education team there um, looking at the use of Lego uh, in schools. And so I'm delighted to uh, get to spend some time with them just starting out with that project though. This is Sorry, an overwhelming. You number overloaded of me. <laughs> I feel like Sorry. asking. I feel like asking how many hours are in your day. <laughs> I, I, see, I don't want, think my brain works the way other people's. This is funny. The, the question of you know how we do it all. Um, it's just always been that way. I'm lucky that I can kind of follow interests, um, but hours in a day is a hard one, Christopher, because um, I'm trying to work on Danish time schedule. Yeah. So my days start quite early. Yes. Okay, I have questions about. Legos. But mm -hmm. first I want to I want to go back to the magic because I noticed it on the playground camp uh site that you had magic tricks and I wondered how that worked in with curriculum and then I was like, well, teaching people to be skeptical is really important. So I'm glad you mentioned that. But on the site there are things like how to do the French drop, which is one of the things that when you're you're uh you're making it appear like coins happen in different places. The French drop is really important. And the thing is, it slows it down. It tells you how to get better. It says, 
you, you, you do the drop and then you, you hold it in the other, you, you pretend to have transferred the coin to the other hand, but now you do it again, but this time really transfer the coin. So you, you get an idea of how you feel, how you look, how you pay attention when the coin is in the hand that appears to be in. So that when the hand, when it isn't in the hand that it appears in, you're just doing the same physical reactions. And I really, really liked that. And it made me want to go through all of the magic lessons because the truth is, I don't know how to do any of this stuff and it's cool. I could totally trick Christopher if I tried. Yeah. You know, all, all credit for all of that goes to Patrick Roche. Um, Patrick was a, gosh, the time that was all happening. I think he was a, he was a fresh freshman or sophomore, maybe sophomore engineering student, electrical engineering, um, also a professional magician, also spent part of his time in college flying out to New York to be an assistant on a magic show. And when we had our all hands Zoom meetings, figuring out how, how are we going to delight all of these kids who were stuck at home at this really scary time in history, particularly, again, the Twin Cities, this incredibly diverse community that was really roiling then after George Floyd's killing. And all the students kind of brought out, well, I could teach this, I could teach that. Uh, and Patrick said, you know, why don't we bring some magic uh, to these boxes that we can send out to kids? And he worked with an interpreter to make sure it was interpreted. And through Patrick, I also learned there's a long history of deaf magicians, um, really rich history. Um, and yeah, that was, I think that was delightful. We did not have a curricular goal to that. Um, honestly, the playground stuff we did that summer, our driving goal was that it would bring joy to kids at a difficult time. It's why every box that was left on their doors also always had snacks. Um, we were just trying to make kids and their, their families smile. Um, and Patrick was right that like magic, and not only did you teach a kid magic in their language. So all those lessons were in Arabic or ASL or Spanish. Um, not only did you do that, then the kids had the material so they could do that for their family members who were also stuck at home at that time. Right. Um, so that was, again, one of these incredible young adults, probably 19, having that idea of like, we could put this in. Um, and he was right. And kids really liked that. Okay. But fast forward to today, or last week is the case maybe, because you were in Denmark at the Lego headquarters. Mm -hmm. Um. There are so many things you can learn with Legos from mechanical engineering to, uh, I mean, you can do storytelling with Legos and there are the kits that you can make art. And it seems, it seems like Lego has gotten to be an ingredient and not an end. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Um, I, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I, I did grow up with Legos. The kits were a lot less um, elaborate in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. Um, but yeah, it's it's this empowering tool that kids and adults gravitate towards. And it can be used in so many different ways. Um, and to me, that that's really sticky. That's really intriguing. Um, and I will say that my introduction to Lego as a company, as opposed to Lego as a toy, um, actually comes through the Lego foundation. Um, not everyone knows this, but Lego, Lego, there's a separate foundation called the Lego foundation. And it does incredible work um, on the study of playful learning and playful parenting in museums, not focused on bricks, truly focused on what is play. Um, and they have done incredible work in Ukraine for decades, I think. And throughout the world that they have had major projects in Mexico and South Africa and really looking throughout the world at what does it mean to learn through play? Um, and how do you engage kids and families and kids with, with special needs and kids who, you know, maybe aren't exceeding in a typical classroom. Um, and I was delighted by finding them, um, gosh, year, gosh, five or six, more than that, even years ago, um, and have read all their papers and, really in awe of the, the international team that the foundation has put together to champion for children and children's voice um, and children's empowerment. Um, and again, you know, it is the Lego foundation, but it's not about the bricks. It's, it's, it's about play um, broadly. And just some, if you're an educator listening, stunning research. Um, th so through that, ment through that philosophy, I I've gotten to meet some incredible researchers and designers and engineers at Lego. Um, and I'm delighted that over the past couple of years have gotten to work with them on some projects. They've, they've done a, they had a playful schools network of administrators from schools around the world. Um, and I got to work with Italian teachers and actually the executive director of Metro Deaf School. 
Um, and so I think that's, you may, we all, many of us smile when we think of Lego, the toys and the bricks. I'm looking at quite a few around me right now uh, here in my office, but the impact and the commitment to meaningful, playful learning uh, and support of child voice is pretty spectacular. Um, so getting to work with any of the teams there in Billund um, delights me, uh, makes me so incredibly happy. And I just hope I can help uh, with the work that they're doing. Um, you may have seen there was a product that they came out with that actually Metro Deaf School got to test early on because Metro Deaf School that we work with, about 13% of the kids are also blind. Uh, so 13% are deaf blind and Lego has a Lego Braille block yeah. kit that the, the kids loved playing with. Uh, so yeah, there's there's so much you can do with it. And I'm truly a kid in a candy store when I get to work with the brilliant and just incredibly kind humans that that are at that company trying to really make us all smile and build. Um, they also, I will say, are doing some great work in environmental sustainability, which is near and dear to my heart. And just, yeah, in terms of companies, that is, that is one that I, I've long admired. So the chance to spend part of my sabbatical working with them uh, is a joy. What about the entrepreneurship aspect? How how does how does playful learning and entrepreneurship overlap? I mean, I get Squishy Circuits that became a company, but you you kind of gave that away. Yeah, I guess I wasn't a good business person in some ways, but I'm, I'm a huge huge fan of the open source hardware uh, movement, so that fit in. Um, you know, how does entrepreneurship tie in? Why? How did I end up as a business professor? If my yeah. PhD is in engineering, it may be a better way to say it. Um, you know, and one one of the ways is that. There has been a long push on human-centered design uh, and design uh, thinking uh, in business schools over the last decade or way beyond, maybe 20 years. Um, if we look at some of the, the, the things like Stanford's D-School and the work of David Kelly and IDEO, many business schools try to teach design. Um, and I'm fortunate at the school that I'm at, we, we are multidisciplinary. And they knew that I had, um, had, had done a lot of work in the design space um, and had um, also taking a year off from the university, I, I, I'm the rare professor who left her position right after getting tenure. Um, and I left to be the founding executive director of the Maker Education Initiative um, back in around 2012. And so through, through those experiences, I was working on nonprofit management, um, but also innovation. Um, and how do we teach, how do we help others come up with new ideas? And so that's, that's my role more in the business school is I... I am there to help with idea generation. I'm there to help kind of nurture, how do we find a need and build off of it? Um, I love learning. So the other reason I'm at a business school is that ooh, like 15 years ago, I went back to school uh, and did a certificate in sustainable design from Minneapolis College of Art and Design. So the courses that I teach in our business school, I teach one in the fall, which is technology prototyping. And it's, it's, it's how to build stuff for business students. So we code, we do some Arduino, we build some circuits, we learn about 3D printing because so many business students want to launch tech companies or products that involve tech, but don't have any experience working with it. Um, so that I get to teach that awesome class where my students are actually wiring things up. Um, even though they're not engineers, they're majoring in entrepreneurship or they're majoring in finance. In the springs, I teach a class on environmental sustainability. Um, and that's just a joy. That class is looking at, you know, the the world of things and how it relates to business. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm lucky that we have a business school that that wanted someone who thinks like a designer um uh, and and let me come in and and work with these awesome students. And I think I think engineers need entrepreneurship, right? Engineering, we need to know how to to implement our ideas. Entrepreneurship doesn't just mean making money. Uh, it, it means finding a need and finding purpose and how to bring ideas to reality. Um, and I, I think there is a really rich space uh, for opportunities working across those disciplines. Does it also mean figuring out when something's not a good idea? <laughs> oh, I love that. Yes. Figuring out when something's not a good idea. Like which ideas should you try and then you give up on at some point? Um, an example that I give my students often Um I think many of your listeners are US, are US based. So, right, if I, I say if you're trying to get to, to Mexico, you're trying to drive south. We're in Minnesota, trying to drive south to Mexico, but your car is pointing towards uh, Canada. Even if you slow the car down, it's not going to help you out. You need to turn direction. There are some times you just have to turn the car around. It doesn't matter if you slow it under speed up. You were going in the wrong direction. And learning how to do that uh, is super important. I'm in the Twin Cities where we have lots of medical companies, um, and often we'll have those 
employees come and help out in our classes. And when I was a very young professor, I remember talking about the joys of the design process and iteration. And one of these, these, these gentlemen from a medical company pulled me aside and said, you know, the way you talk about iteration isn't really accurate. He said, you know, you you make it sound like iterating is this great thing. Iterating is good. However, iterating, you know, you, you want to find problems as early as you can to save money. Um, and building a full-scale bridge to find out the design was wrong, it would have been nice if you could have figured that out in software. Uh, so I, I think there's a nuance there, right, of how do you know when something's not going to work? And that's something that that I think maybe wasn't my strongest suit when I was younger. Um, I would I would bang at things a lot longer. Um, and I hope I've gotten better. And I hope this is one of the ways that I teach and I run my lab is getting my students involved in as many projects as I can. Because I think it's through projects and experience, you learn what's going to work and what isn't going to work. And some of those signs for when something isn't going to work. Um, that It's a little bit more of an art than a science, figuring out that, that intuition. Uh, I have a couple of more questions from Lenore of Evil Mad Scientist Laboratories. Uh, what are your favorite things about working with undergraduates? My favorite thing about working with undergraduates is that for many of them, they don't have a lot of experience about how things are normally done in corporate or design, et cetera, settings. So they dream bigger in many cases, I think, than we typically do after we've been working for a long time. Um, and they they can really throw a lot of energy and enthusiasm and all the skills that they have by being typically young into those projects. Um, and that doesn't just mean energy. I think we forget sometimes that when we're growing up, everything is new. It's amazing. The kids are not constantly overwhelmed by the world because everything is new as you're growing up and different. And so you're constantly being thrust into new situations by definition. Um, and everything requires you to do to really do things that you haven't done before. And so that mindset is incredible when you're working on projects. Um, I remember a project about five years ago, I read into the lead singer from the rock band, OK Go, and I was a fan, and we decided to start an education project together immediately. Um, and we were suddenly filming projects with them. And within months, we had launched a major website with education materials led by in creation, like led by the led by these students who were 18 to 22 year olds and coming up with lesson plans and testing them in classrooms. And I remember someone, one of the, the funders of that project saying, it just shouldn't be possible to do all of this in three months. Like this, this shouldn't be possible. And I get that a lot. I get when students, we have low expectations for young adults, I think, and what they can accomplish. And they are sometimes just the most amazing results that they, they want to accomplish something. They want to do something and they haven't been told no as often as maybe those of us who are a bit older have been. Yes. That optimism, that certainty you can do it, that ability to believe and to get it done through belief. Yes, that's all very inspirational. <laughs> it's right. The optimism. I, I, I wrote a book a few years ago and I interviewed, I was really intrigued by, particularly in the early days of the maker movement and maker fairs, just some of the audacious projects that were happening and people doing things that they hadn't been formally trained for and the, the ability to just be persistent. And so I interviewed dozens of, of folks who create physical things uh, about their childhoods and about what they do. And honestly, I mean, one of the, one of the things that I think held true across almost all of them, besides of course, persistence and some playfulness was optimism that you inherently, if you set out to build something, you, you think that you can figure it out. Um, and if you're the kind of person that goes about assuming you can figure things out, that doesn't seem revolutionary to you. But there are a lot of people that see hard things and think, well, I couldn't do that. And so that optimism that I can do something, I can learn this, I can make a change, um, is an incredibly powerful thing. I mean, that makes sense. You're not going to make changes if you don't believe you can. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something, if you look at history and you read a lot of history, um, we, we, we see that play out. Maybe we're even seeing that play out today in many realms. So one of the reasons reading science fiction is is something I think is important because it's the opposite. It's trying to think of all the different things that could happen and just thinking that they could means that they can. I just proposed a class, a, a, an engineering class where you had to read science fiction stories throughout it. 
Um, because yeah, you have to learn. This is one of the things with engineering. I always ask students, well, I often ask students why they became an engineering major. And quite a few of them will say, well, I'm good at math and science. And my teachers told me, you know, I should, I should do that. And that's a valid answer, um, but I don't think it's all of it. Um, I, I really think that engineering and particularly engineering design, um, those are tools. If you were, if you wanted to be a novelist and you memorized the dictionary and all the rules of grammar, that wouldn't mean that you'd write the next great novel. It would just mean that you knew the words to use once you got an idea, but the ideas have to come from somewhere. And I think engineering and design are very similar in that you can learn all the physics and you can, you can learn all the calculus and you can be really good at chemistry. But those textbooks don't have the ideas that lead to safer transportation and clean water and all of the things that that have hopefully changed lives for the better. Math and physics alone don't do that. You need something else that you apply the tools of math and physics and science and English, et cetera, to. And if we just focus on the core classes and experiences we aren't giving kids the tools to dream up the things that they then want to apply those tools to. And I think you're completely right, Alicia, that it's, it's science fiction, it's stories, it's taking a walk, it's the history class. Um, I'm incredibly fortunate that I teach at a liberal arts school. Every one of my engineering students has to take foreign languages, has to take philosophy, has to take history, has to take art. I could keep going. Um, and I, I think that's incredible. And I think it's not just nice. I think it's essential. Um, because you need to learn how to dream big and how to come up with new ideas. And yeah, what better place than literature to inspire some of those? I, I'm an avid reader, so I'm there with you. I have a comment and then a question. The comment is uh, what you're describing about just not synthesizing all of this, you know, the dictionary and, and such and, and facts and figures to, and then expecting ideas to come out is exactly why I'm not impressed by large language models. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you for... for <laughs> Got to get that dig in. <laughs> oh, I'd love to have that conversation with you, Christopher. I think there's a lot... Ooh, yes. I, oh, I have a, I have a I have an education coming on GPT. If you want to ask me, I'll give it. I'll wait for that. Uh, the second question, uh, have you already come up with the reading list for the science fiction class? Oh, no. We could just have another you know, show right it now. Was, it was a thought <laughs> exercise, um, the, the class, and I, I, I don't think the class is coming anytime soon. Um, I So I everyone should send me the, the stories that they think that engineering students should read. I would love to hear those. Um, I'm a huge fan of the writings of Mary Robinette Cowell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, who wrote the calculating stars, but she's also written, uh, I worked in a research lab when I was doing my PhD. I didn't work on the project, but other people in the lab worked on brain computer interfaces. Um, something that's come close to home as I've lost two friends to uh, ALS. And she wrote a very, thought-provoking and kind of chilling story about brain-computer interfaces um, and locked-in syndrome. And I think authors such as Mary Robinette and so many others, I'm looking I'm looking at my desk right now, and the best book I've read this year mm. um, is Mountain in the Sea by Ray Naylor. Um, incredible. I cannot recommend it enough. It's about AI. It's about cephalopods. What? These How do you not know about this book? How have I not read this book? Cephalopods. She, she's read every book about cephalopods. <laughs> Oh, everyone. I have, I have given Ray's book to over 20 people at this point. Um, man, it is, I, I bought a bulk order and I've been shipping them after I read it because <laughs> it's incredible. Um, and a side note I will say is I have some friends who are blind and I wanted to gift the book to them. And if you read The Mountain in the Sea, you will see that, literally you will see, that um, symbols make, they're, they're quite important in the story. And I, I actually asked Ray, I called Ray and asked Ray if, um, how that was handled in the audiobook because I wanted to give it to a blind astronomer. And he had a great answer and that they had thought of it very thoughtfully and it wasn't an afterthought. So stories like that just make me think through what technology and science and what humans can be. And so I, I, I know it's sometimes a badge of pride for people, particularly in engineering, to say that they, they read nonfiction. I don't read fiction. And I think it's very sad when people tell me that they won't read fiction. They don't have time for it because I think we need, we need those bursts of inspiration. We need those bursts of ideas. Um, and yeah, it's, it, that's different than your textbooks. I, I would argue that reading stories is just as, as important to being a designer as learning the tools. I see. It's a new book. It's full price. That's why I haven't read it yet. <laughs> and our library isn't open yet. Another few months and our library will reopen. Ooh. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm so excited about the uh, 
a book cephalopod AI. It's so it's incredible. It's incredible. I got it because it had a cephalopod. I, well, I had an octopus on the cover, and I researched how part of my PhD was researching how octopi and other sea creatures, cetaceans, swim. Not cetaceans, cephalopods. Yeah, 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 cephalopods. I did cetacean swimming in college research, Ooh. but grad school it was cephalopods. Um, and I just thought the cover was beautiful, and I wasn't sure what I was getting into. And before I'd even finished it, I had ordered 20 copies to send to friends. That is how good it is, particularly, I think, with a lot of our discussions right now about AI and humanity and environmental science, like just an incredible book. Have you read Cy Montgomery's Soul of an Octopus? I haven't, but I am now writing it down as I talk and I'm going to read that. It's it's nonfiction, but it feels fiction in the depth she goes into to talk about cephalopod intelligence and how would we even recognize such an alien form of intelligence? Okay, so you are perfectly set up to read The Mountain and the Sea. That is kind of at the crux of it. And I should be I should be I should be clear that I'm I'm a fan of reading all things, fiction and nonfiction. So I have stacks, much to the chagrin of my partner. Uh, my my poor husband is <laughs> would love my library to go fully Kindle, but I, I love having books around me. Oh, I'm I'm pretty good with the electronic because I like to have all of the books around me all of the time. But that's why I don't pay full price. I think I'm a very spatial learner and I love the physicality of books. So I can kind of remember like where on a page and like how far in my hand was on something. Mm, Yeah. Books, books, books. You you mentioned writing a book. Um, Was that making makers, kids, tools and the future of innovation? Oh, yes, that is the book. Yes. Um, <laughs> she was worried there for a second. <laughs> I was kind of worried. Yeah, that is the book. I, I've been fortunate. I've, I've, as we kind of hit on, I, I never know what's coming next. And so there's, there's been a lot of, I love, I so respect editors and authors. And yeah, so the, the longest book I've ever written, I guess, is Making Makers, Kids Tools and the Futures of Innovation. And I think uh, many of your guests, past guests, I think are some of the people that I've interviewed in it. It was such a joy to hear their stories. You mentioned being a reader, and I always get the idea that the people who become makers and engineers tend to be the ones who take apart their toys and their telephones and everything around them. But I was never that kid. I was I was read all the time, anything I could get my hands on, but did never took apart my toys, then they would be gone. You you were in good company. Um, many of the interviews I did were folks that 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 read a lot. Some people took things apart. Some people built things. Lots of people read stories. I remember Danny Hillis talked a lot about the books that he read, and you know, he's done some pretty interesting forward-thinking things since then. Since then, and actually, we mentioned underwater robotics early on. And one of my mentors, uh, Paul McGill, who's at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, um, incredible builder of robots. But as a kid, he he read lots of books loved books about adventure um, and actually convinced his t- teachers in, I think it was like fourth grade that instead of writing a book report um, on one of the books that was about an explorer in the Arctic, he was allowed to instead build a working model with like a little flickering light and everything, which was pretty advanced uh, making at that age. I thought you were going to say he, he convinced his teacher to let him go to the Arctic, but that really didn't make sense at fourth grade. Oh, no, it didn't. But actually, one of my that is one of my favorite stories is Paul McGill, who is an electrical engineer in Ambari. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a diorama that he built based on the book Alone, the classic polar adventure. Um, and what I love about Paul, when I, when I wrote the book, I didn't even know the story, but I put him in a chapter on resourcefulness. And I asked him to send me a picture that I could put in, have published in the book with the publisher. And he sent me a book. I sent me a picture of him and some other engineers um, in Antarctica with a robot. Um, that they were sending down a remotely operated vehicle. And it got some great data. And the more I looked at the picture, the more I realized that the robot did not look that impressive to me. The robot looked really scrappy and not the kind of thing that you would send to Antarctica, which is very expensive to work on. Um, And I asked him about it and it's named the Phoenix. And I thought this was an added picture later to the book um, at the end, but it actually ended up being part of the book because what it turned out was that when Paul, this little boy who dreamt of going to the Arctic and who was a tinkerer and loved to figure out how to build things. Him and his incredible team went to the Antarctic, which is very expensive. um, And they also don't have Amazon deliveries there. And the ROV that they've brought on the research mission went under the ice and didn't come back. Mm. 
and you're paying a lot of money every day and you've got scientists and they're all really frustrated. And what do you do in that case? Um, well, <laughs> what you do is you have Paul and others go around the building and find what you can find, spare underwater cameras and thrusters and maybe some backup electronics. And they actually built a new ROV um, that they titled the Phoenix that <laughs> swam under the, the Antarctic ice and got the data that Ambari needed. Uh, so, you know, yeah, the stories like that, I just, I love that ingenuity and that persistence. And that was a little boy who, well, he did take things apart, I, he, but he was right with you reading everything he could get his hands on. So this book was published almost a decade ago. I feel old. Oh, sorry. That's no, okay. I teach undergrads. I feel old every day. Is there anything you'd change now? The maker movement has changed in the last decade. Is it? Oh, the maker movement has changed immensely. Um, and, you know, I, I consider myself really lucky that I got to be there for a lot of the early days and Squishy Circuits was early on. And I, I spent a year you know, leading Maker Education Initiative, which was a nonprofit that was that was out doing a lot of work um, and working with schools and libraries. Would I change anything? Well, I mean, I think anyone who writes a book would always want to change a few things. But I think at its heart, I stand by everything I said. Um, the preface talks a bit about the maker movement, as we might describe it historically. Um, but the mindset I think is pretty evergreen. Um, and it was my attempt at figuring out what that would be, but, you know, I said, here are the things that make a maker. And I said, it's curiosity, it's playfulness, it's risk, it's responsibility, it's persistence, it's resourcefulness, it's generosity, it's optimism. Um, and I think I would stand by all of those things, you know, whether we call it making, yeah, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, what matters to me is that we give kids that we empower kids that we empower children to not wait until they're older to try to figure out who they want to be in the world and how they can they can make a mark um literally or figuratively um and really trusting them and letting them do things um a lot of makers if they wanted to read they were allowed to read if they wanted to build stuff they built stuff but they did things that today we might consider oh you can do that when you're older a child is too young to do that i remember i i came across a toy that was called, well, I won't name it, but a toy that was a construction toy for kids. And it prided itself on how it wasn't dangerous because the tools were all plastic and foam. Um, but if you look historically, kids have been building stuff with real tools from kindergarten on. You know, if we look at John Dewey in the, the Chicago Laboratory School, they were building their own clubhouses at like 10. So I think I don't, I would, well, maybe where the maker movement was going changed a little bit. I think the part of it um, hasn't changed. And I think that's partially because it's part of a long tradition. Um, the maker movement gave a name to something, gave a name in a community to something that I think has been along as long as there have been humans. Okay. That brings up another question from Lenore. Uh, what communities do you feel connected to or part of, and what is important to you about those communities? Oh, that's a really hard question. Um, that's a really hard, it really, really is. It's a really hard question. Um, because as an educator and as someone who does the work I do, um, I was really amused to find out that people really consider me an extrovert. And the truth of the matter is I'm actually a very, very much an introvert. Um, and, but I know when it's important to, I, I have theater training. And I know when it's important to, to, to be a little bigger and to be on stages, but it takes a lot out of me. Mm -hmm. um, so finding communities is really hard for me. I, I value the friendships that I have because I don't go out very much. Um, and in fact, I've learned to build the communities that I feel comfortable in and find folks that I can, can be with that way. And an example of that um, is that I was given a gift of an evening out theater and dinner with a bunch of other people over a decade ago. And I wanted to send a thank you to the person who did it, but they had just sold a company. And I mean, really, what could I give them that they didn't have, or they, if they wanted it, they would have bought it. So how to come up with something, what can I give to someone who really could have anything? And it was people and it was community. And so I decided I was going to start a book club um, and we'd do it online 15 years ago. And then I realized that the friends I have probably would just not find time to read the book and then would fake it. And then what's the point of the book club? That's why we do so, poetry. <laughs> so um, we changed it and I called it a salon and I did it with a co-host. And I said, you know, to this, to this co-host, I said, we're going to invite our friend who gifted us this wonderful evening, but I want you to come up with a list of five people that you know well that you want to know better and you think I should know. And I'll come up with a list too. And so in November, we sent an email to about 12 people and we said, 
we'd like to invite you to a salon for the year. And what that means is that for 90 minutes, once a month, we're all going to join online. Um, I forget, we were probably using Google Meets at the time. We're going to join online and you have to commit that you're going to come to all of them. Um, you know, we know you're going to travel once in a while, but you have to really commit to this. And you have to commit that you're going to host once. And when it is your time to host, you need to mail a package to everybody else in the salon. And we won't open it until that evening. So once a month, this community where no one really knew each other, except for the two co-hosts who knew half of the group each, would get together. And perhaps an editor would have sent a paper that we all read and edited and then talked about how we edit it. Or maybe someone would send some LEDs and batteries. Or maybe someone would send a food sampler and we'd taste different chocolates and talk about them. Or there was a biologist who sent a mouse and scalpel oh, God. Now rolled against that. Um, and everyone had their turn to share and to teach. And at the end, we would have a gift exchange. The last session was usually right before the new year. And we'd have a gift exchange where you send a gift to everybody. And this was an interesting community in that I set a rule that it had to end after 12 months. And people would always want to extend them. And in fact, one group went rogue and extended it without me. But I wouldn't condone extending them. Um, this was a 12-month experiment. And then everyone should go start their own salon with someone else from that group. Uh, and some people have done that and taken one of the people that they met through salon and started their own year-long experiment of people gathering once a month for 90 minutes and mailing out packages and building something together or tasting something together. Um, so that was one community that I love. And that salon, I think we've had over 10 years of that. I just have to go back and look at my list, but I got to meet these new people and I'd always have a co-host and basically say like, I'm shy, who should I meet? And they would invite their people and I'd invite my people. Um, and, it, and it just kept working. And I could do it in my pajamas from my house. Um, other communities that I am part of that I really appreciate is I always say I'm a professor who aspires to be a teacher. Um, I have nothing but just the respect and awe of folks who teach, particularly at the K-12 level. Um, and so I am incredibly fortunate that I get to spend a lot of time on projects with educators and get to know them and have them as my friends. Um, and yeah, I, I think those are... Communities are kind of what you make them. Um, and I think being part of that and being around people and intergenerational is what I aspire to. That's what's, what's important to me. Um, but but I also am an introvert, so I love my books. Uh, our book club moved to short stories and poetry because we admitted that we weren't likely to finish books. I love that. So I, I do get some of that. But as you went to different salons in different years, did you invite the same people yourself? No, never. No, I would, I, so the deal, I made the rules and stuck to them and they've changed a little pandemic, but you know, it would be me and a co-host and we were together, we put together a group of 10 and each co-host should only know half of them. Um, and then at the end of the year, I would allow myself to ask one person in that group to start the next one and hopefully other people paired off too. Uh, so no, I didn't get to repeat the same group of people. So now I've got dozens of new friends thanks to that. But that would mean you had to start out with more than 50 people. You know, if you did this over 10 years and five people per 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 year yeah um well people i know but the trick was if they're my best friends i shouldn't invite them um, ah, so okay. they should be people that i want to know better um and so sometimes they're people that i really didn't know um they they were people that i like actually one person was a teacher who someone canceled right before something happened they're like you know what i can't make this commitment and so i just went on well at the time twitter which i used to be on and said you know is anyone free in the next hour. And if so, like DM and interested in, I forget what I wrote, but DM me and this amazing teacher from Philadelphia wrote, and they were an integral part of salon for that year. I noticed on Mastodon that you are not finding the transition to be good, that Twitter was better for you than Mastodon is. Uh, I mean, that could just be me. Um, I had just sunk everything into Twitter it was my place and I met so many people and I had followers and there was discussions and yeah, I, I'm, I'm still learning on Mastodon. It takes, it takes time to learn a new tool. And I don't know that I have the time. Um, so hopefully, hopefully I'll, I'll find my way on Mastodon. I'm trying. I haven't, I haven't been as engaged. And so I don't know whether the lack of, of community there is due to my own lack of engagement. But Chris, you've had better luck. You, you say that you're a lot more engaged on mm -hmm. Mastodon. Yeah, I don't know. I, I see a lot of people who have similar things, say similar things like this isn't working for me. Um, I followed a whole bunch of people. I followed a bunch of whole, uh, when I started, I followed a whole bunch of hashtags. So it's like, oh, uh, let's follow astrophotography and bird photos and music and drums and whatever I was interested in. So I followed a bunch of hashtags to start with. And that brought in a lot of people who I didn't know who talked about those topics and then I would follow them. But I follow a lot more people than I did on Twitter. 
uh, I probably, I've, on Twitter, I usually followed about a hundred people and I had, I think I had a few thousand followers and now I follow probably 500, three, four or 500 people. And so there's more stuff going on. It's, it's a different place. I think also people with large followings and big interactions, you're starting over kind of. Yeah. I mean, you might pull some pe- some people over, but. Oh, that's for me. That's what it is. I think I, it's not the platform. It's me. Yeah. And it's years and years of building that community on Twitter. And now it's okay. I want that immediately on Mastodon, but it's, it's hard to build, but it's, it's a different place in some ways. And some of the people, you know, some of the people I used to interact with aren't there and I've had to replace them with new people. (laughs) I guess I have had more luck with hashtags than I ever did with Twitter, but then sometimes those get dirtied with junk posts, but mostly I think it's my engagement. I think that in order to find the community I had before, I have to post more and wait for things to trickle out and then follow the people who are following me to find them. But it's funny because many of the people you followed are are there. Uh, So I don't know. But there's no obligation to do it either. (laughs) So Well, the good thing about those communities, those big public communities, is that it is public facing and you can talk to, I want to say strangers, but the whole internet is strangers. It's strangers who you might have things in common with. Right. (laughs) The flip side is they can talk to you. That is the flip side. (laughs) I'm sorry, Anne Marie. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm learning because I, yeah, I, I have to. I'm trying to decide how I feel about social media. I loved that we could just go on things once you've invested years in it. So Twitter, I could yeah. go on and I could get feedback right away. And I just have to get, I just have to find the energy. I'm a little busy right now. I'm also a mom. Like I'm like, all right, I just need to commit to a platform and put the time in. And I, I just haven't managed to convince myself to do it yet. I totally understand. <laughs> I have one more question for you. Sure. And this this is this is maybe me being envious. You talked about the Lagrange point and and tying people up and making them spin around until they barf. Although I don't think that's how you phrased it. You're you're paraphrasing this interestingly. Um, yeah, that wasn't how I phrased it. There was no vomiting. I'm, if if the university's lawyer or safety officers are listening, there was no vomiting. And while you were talking about that, I was thinking about curl ball space program because that's that's also a fun way to learn some of the physics uh, that doesn't involve undergrads spinning around. Um, but for the most part, kids get to learn things in a playful learning manner. Like we want them to be engaged. We spend a lot of time figuring out how to educate them so that they're amused and educated and interested and curious and enthusiastic and all those things. But then when I have to learn something, it's like, step one, find the Lagrange point. Step two, create a matrix. Step three, I don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. How do we... Is there any impetus? Is is there anybody thinking about how to make adults have more fun with playful learning? And does the definition of play change as you think about adults versus kids? Oh, I don't know if the definition changes. I think our attitudes towards it change. Um, and, you know, we say like, okay, stop playing around and get to work. Yeah. That's a phrase we hear people say. Um, I've even caught myself saying it a few times, unfortunately. And we've we've prioritized what we call work over what we call play but i would argue that so many aspects of play um could actually help you work better and particularly if you're in a space where you're creating new things that play can be a tool um i've gotten i've gotten to go to many companies and work with them on you know what is play and how do we use how do we use it and how do we use it to design and i think it's this false sense that growing up means that you have to get serious and that play should go away. And it's it's interesting, even in the museum world, sometimes I've heard people, some museums that are doing amazing work and parents will say things like, oh, well, the kids are just playing around. They're not learning anything. Like it's, this used to have more content. And that's not really how we learn. This is, I mentioned the Lego Foundation, and I love the, the research they've been championing around the world on what it means to play and what it means to learn. And it's a false assumption that now that you, you and I are older, that we should learn differently. Um, everyone learns differently. And some people love, I, I did an exercise once at a conference where I asked people to tell me their most meaningful learning experience. 
And it was an hour and a half. And I told people that they weren't allowed to comment on each other. So we just were going to listen to everyone's story. And a lot of people told stories like things like circus or we talk about or doing something really active. But there was one, gen- there was one gentleman who said, I love being in a large lecture hall and listening to a professor lecture and watching them write on the board. And that's how I learned best. And a lot of people were shocked by that. And I, I think actually that's beautiful. That's why we have such a diverse world and so many cool things because everyone learns differently and everyone acts differently. And play play looks different for many different people, but play is about process more so than outcome. Play is about choice. Play is about other people. And the shorthand that I use in my lab, when we're looking at anything, be it creating a class or creating a workshop or teaching a concept, my shorthand checklist, I write it down, literally write it down, are four things that I try to integrate into anything I'm doing, whether I'm teaching adults, whether I'm teaching my kids, anyone. And it's, where's joy? How do we make people smile? Uh, where's the whimsy? How can we just be a little bit ridiculous? Uh, where is the surprise? Where is something unexpected? So maybe it's not surprising that I've you know, fallen for magic um, because it's all about surprise and wonder. Uh, and then the last one is new people. Um, you know, you can play by yourself, but most play involves other people. And those four elements, I don't care if I'm designing a lesson for a five-year-old or I'm designing a lesson for a 95-year-old. Um, I want to make them smile. I want to make them you know, a little, a little surprised. Um, you know, it's not, not just surprise for surprise sake. It changes your, how you're learning things. When you're, when you're surprised, you're suddenly more alert. Uh, so I, I, I think, I think play we don't outgrow. I know we don't outgrow play and I hope we don't expect people to outgrow play. I think too, it's kind of hard because there's certain things that play lends itself easier to. Your example of doing Lagrangian mechanics was interesting to me because it's that's starting to get to the point where the mathematics is getting more abstract, a little more difficult. Um, I was thinking of things like, okay, how would I apply this to say undergraduate or, or early graduate quantum mechanics, which is a lot of math, a lot of symbols and stuff, and not a lot of things you can play with. Not a lot of intuition on paper, either. Not a lot of intuition. Um, yeah, but we can also be playful in our approach to it. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Again, if we're thinking about it like joy, I mean, you know, it's something as simple as I, I for a long time, was running play dates before the pandemic for teachers. And I always brought food. I always brought cookies. I always brought, you know, some gluten-free ones also. And it was just about that moment of like, okay, they were kind of surprised that I brought food and wasn't charging for it. And we could just, you know, eat something silly. Um, just changing that, changing that approach that this is not a, this doesn't have to be a serious place. We can still learn, we can still learn new things, um, hard things, even if we laugh or we smile. Um, I, I have confess I haven't completely read it yet, um, but a new book has just came out recently that I, I have sitting here in front of me um, called Sparking Creativity, How Play and Humor Fuel Innovation and Design. And it's by Barry Kudrowitz, who's a professor who of design um, who really focuses on humor um, and bringing that into the innovation process. And I think these are all tools. I'm not a very funny person. I don't really <laughs> tell many jokes, but if that is if that is the way that you can bring some joy and surprise and whimsy to people, that's that's playful. And I think it's finding what works for different audiences. Um, to me, play is about humans and it's about connecting with people and whether we're teaching matrices, whether we're teaching history, you know, how can we remember that we're not, we're not teaching those things. We're not teaching history. We're teaching humans about history. We're teaching 18 year olds about quantum mechanics. Um, and keeping play in mind reminds us to remember that we're humans first. I used to have, uh, I had a professor and uh, to, to, to hear you talk about how, how to in- integrate some sense of playfulness. And he would always remind us um, as he's up there on the board, you know, scrawling symbols and mathematics and things that really doing physics, we're all wizards because we're all up here scrawling these arcane things on, <laughs> on, on, on the whiteboard to manipulate or understand, you know, how the universe works. And these are all casting spells. It was, it was an interesting way to reframe things. Um, that I always liked, but. And that frame matters. The way you frame it changes how you receive it. It absolutely does. And I think it's one of the sad things about STEM education, honestly, um, is that we push so many kids towards it and it's this great field, but then they get to college and historically, um, and this is, this is changing, 
But historically, your professors who are teaching at universities or teaching particularly STEM topics like engineering uh, or math or physics, they have a PhD in those topics, which we know they need to learn in, but they maybe have never, ever learned how to teach. <laughs> yeah. um, and many, many, many graduate programs, the focus isn't on ever learning to teach. And of course, you'd be being taught by someone who never studied pedagogy or psychology or assessment. Um, the focus is on the research. And being a good researcher does not mean you're going to be a good teacher. And so I think we, and we, we then give people grades on these topics and those grades can destroy us. Um, I was not a, in quotes, good student. Um, my GPA in grad school was a 2.8. I could not have worked any harder. Um, thanks to teachers showing the grades on the board, I know exactly how low I was compared to everyone else. And I would retake things as needed and I would try to understand them. And if the class involved building something, I got an A. If it didn't involve a project, I did not get an A and probably not a B. But I put a lot of judgment on myself based on getting that grade, that C. And stepping back now that I'm older, I was getting a C from someone who probably had never been taught what a C was versus a B versus an A, really from a from a pedagogical or learning objective standpoint. And yet it could have really broken me and it did at times as as a student. So I think that that always worries me. Um, there, there's a great um, book um, called The Amateur Hour, College Teaching. Oh, yeah, the history of college teaching in America that came out a few years ago. And I mean, it's true. Like it sort of is amateur hour in a lot of ways. And thankfully, learning science and pedagogy is being pushed uh, to the forefront by a lot of universities, including my own. Um, but that it isn't the same training. You know, if you're a K-12 student, you have, if you are at a public school in the U.S., you have a teacher who is, in most cases, of course, there are exceptions, accredited teacher who has studied pedagogy and it was in learning circles and has worked on these things and gotten a degree in this. And that's that's different when you go to college, when you're this young adult trying to prove yourself. And it can be really damaging to go into a class where you're told that you're not cut out for this. That would be. I mean, I, I, I totally pedagogy. I, I actually concentrated my nerd in theories of learning, and that those classes kind of broke my brain. On the other classes I was taking, it was kind of like, come on, you're all teaching this the thing correctly. Cl- te- cl- <laughs> teachers tells me how to teach, and then I watch you people, and I wonder what you're doing because it's not what they said that you should be doing. Uh, yes. And the idea that we teach pedagogy and how to teach to high school teachers, but for college professors, it's like, well, while you've been through enough years, didn't you pick it up? Yep. Isn't really the right answer. I mean, it's why, honestly, why I'm glad I'm on sabbatical. Teaching is exhausting because we are, we are at any level, but I would also say, especially at college in the U S we know how much money is being spent by the typical family to go to college Wow, it's a big responsibility to be a professor. Um, you know, you have the ability to make a huge impact, positive or negative or none, um, on someone who could be anything five years from now. Um, it's why I don't have graduate students. Um, I've had a few graduate students over the years, art history. I think they were all art history education. But most of my students are undergraduates from a variety of majors. And it's because I want to show them that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay. The projects don't work out and that they don't have that they can, they can do these things. Um, I, I, I'm so proud of these young adults and the work they do, but it's scary. (laughs) It's terrifying. Even in my forties, if I teach, like if I teach this class, I could convince someone that they might love this field, but I could also just as easily convince them that they don't belong here. They're not welcome. And that could be it. That could be the end of that person pursuing that topic. I don't know that enough. I don't know if folks are scared about the power that we wield as teachers. It's it's daunting to me at times. That almost happened to me, but then I got really mad and went back and <laughs> got a degree in the thing I hated. <laughs> yes, Christopher, why did you get a physics degree? Because I was so mad about undergraduate physics. <laughs> so mad. <laughs> so I'm lucky in that I always had bad grades. I even got like an unacceptable in handwriting in kindergarten and or first grade. And I was I'm one of the most avid readers I know, but I was... I was in the rocket reading group in first grade, which as we probably could all guess means that I couldn't read to save my life. And they were trying to like inspire us. Um, but I got, I, even now I'm a student at Gallatin and I've had to repeat a couple of my classes. I think I learn a lot slower than most people around me and always have. 
but I became comfortable with the idea that if I don't learn it the first time, maybe I can learn it the second time. And that doesn't mean that I should never do this. Um, and I, I've learned that that isn't necessarily how everyone approaches the world. And I'm incredibly fortunate that my parents instilled that, that I wasn't a failure. If I literally failed a class, I just had to do it again. Yeah. That's, that's a super important lesson that I think many, many people don't understand. It's like, oh, this just isn't for me if I can't do it the first time. Or maybe, you know, or think it's about them and not perhaps the way it was taught. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it, it, people can learn things. Sometimes it just takes a little longer. And sometimes it's harder for one person than another. Yeah. That doesn't mean right. that either one is better. And maybe taking twice as long means you know it better. <laughs> yes, or that you can teach it better because yeah. you understand all of the, the cul-de-sacs. Yeah. yeah, I would be very wary of a teacher who has only ever gotten 4.0s. Um, I want, I want, I want teachers who know what it's like not to understand something. I, I feel like asking you for a final thought is kind of redundant after that. Cause that was pretty good. But do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Oh, that's a hard one. I mean, I think the, the, the biggest thing I've learned is that no one really has all the answers. Um, and that we're all just kind of doing the best we can. Um, and to look for those people that you can help along the way and those, and be very grateful for the ones that are helping you. Um, you know, if we don't, we don't know how long we've got those, those people around. So look for those friends, look for those helpers and make sure they know how much you appreciate them. Our guest has been Anne-Marie Thomas, professor of engineering and professor of entrepreneurship at the University of St. Thomas. Check out her book, Making Makers at a bookstore near you. And of course, there'll be links in the show notes. Thanks, Professor Thomas. Thanks for having me. Thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. Thank you to Lenore and Wendell of the Evil Mad Scientist Laboratories for the connection. And thank you to the Patreon listener Slack group for supporting us with cash and questions. <laughs> and thank you for listening. You can always contact us at show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on embedded.fm. And now a quote from Fred Rogers. Play is often talked about as if it was a relief from serious things. But for children, play is serious learning. Play is really the work of childhood. Welcome to Embedded. I am Elysia White. He <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't remember your name. I'm sorry. You can remember my name? <laughs> wow. <laughs>